Super team, assemble. Welcome in to an emergency edition of Fantasy Baseball today, very late on Thursday, December 21st. I am Frank Sample, joined by Scott White, and we've been waiting patiently to find out where Japanese phenom Yoshinobu Yamamoto would sign. And it turns out he'll be joining Shohei Otani and Tyler Glass now on the Los Angeles Dodgers. What is the contract, you ask? Just a cool 12 years, $325 million which gives Yamamoto the largest contract for a pitcher in MLB history, beating out Garrett Cole by a mere $1 million. It's it's funny how that works usually, at, huh? Uh, I just love when contracts <laughs> that happen. Like Lindor got one more million dollar more than, uh, than Fernando Tatis, and now here we got Yamamoto, $1 million more than... Uh, so competitive, these guys. My goodness. Crazy stuff. Anywho, some quick background, Scott, and then I'll let you get into your spiel here on uh, Yamamoto. 25 years old. He's been a phenom the past, really his whole career, but you look at the past three years in particular, he has had an ERA under 1.7 each of those years, winning the Sawamura Award, which is ja Japan's version of the Cy Young, and the league MVP in each of the past three years. So mm -hmm. just amazing stuff, joining an awesome team, great run support. Your immediate reaction, Yamamoto to the Dodgers. Well, a couple other tidbits to describe Yamamoto's greatness. You mentioned uh, three consecutive MVP awards in the uh, in, in the Pacific League of uh, in, in Japan. The last player to do that to win three consecutive Pacific League MVP awards was Ichiro Suzuki. So, you know, it's not like that's a common thing in Japan. It's it's it's. It's something that hasn't been done in a couple decades, and it, it was done by a pitcher this time. Yamamoto's numbers during that three-year period, 9.5K per nine, 0 0.88 whip, a 142 ERA over a three-year period. And you know, a couple of those years, he exceeded 190 innings. So like he's he's proven durable on top of everything else. When we've talked about Yoshinobu Yamamoto in the past, in, in recent weeks, we've referenced that scouting report, Eno Saris, uh, pitcher analyst extraordinaire Eno Saris wrote for The Athletic just a couple of weeks ago. And the way he did it was he, he broke down the individual pitch characteristics for Yamamoto to kind of uh, making comps for each of his pitches. And it reads like one of those articles that come out during like, slow news periods where what if we could assemble the perfect pitcher? It would have the fastball of this guy, the splitter of this guy. Well, that, that's, that actually sounds like the way, you know, Saris was describing Yamamoto. He compared his splitter to Kevin Gosman's, which is like the gold standard for that pitch. He compared his curveball to uh, Max Freed and Seth Lugo. He compared his command to uh, Zach Eflin and George Kirby, two pitchers who, I mean, walks per nine last year. Zach Eflin was 1.2 walks per nine, and George Kirby was uh, 1. Point, oh, 0 0.9. 0 0.9. Let, let all the majors did Kirby. and that. So that's what Eno Sayers compared Yamamoto's con command to. And that's not even to speak of the fastball, which peaks at 99 miles per hour and has the rising effect that that teams are looking for these days, a swing and miss offering in its own right. Um, and then there's a cutter as well. So like Yamamoto, it, it sounds, it sounds unfair basically that somebody like this could exist. And, you know, I guess that explains why the numbers in Japan were, were so phenomenal, why he comes so decorated and get this. He's done all this. Yamamoto has, before even really entering his prime, he just turned 25 years old in August. So, I mean, I, I guess that's the justification for giving him a 12-year deal. Still an awfully long time for the pitcher, for a pitcher. I mean, Garrett Cole's deal was over nine years. This is over 12 years. But, you know, he won't even be 40 by the end of it, Will Yamamoto. So, um, <laughs> it's, it's, of course an unknown how that's all going to translate to the majors there are a lot of complicating factors but 
I mean, we saw what Kodai Senka did last year with much clearer flaws than Yamamoto has. And um, not as complete an arsenal, not nearly as good a command as Yamamoto has. And, and, you know, he was, he was great. Was Kodai Senga. He was somebody you wanted to start basically every time out, uh, at least over the final four months or so. And I have him as a top 15 pitcher now going into this upcoming season based on what Kodai Senga did as a rookie. So if that's what Senga became in that first year, adjusting to the majors, what's Yamamoto going to be? I, I mean, I, the sky's the limit. I, I, I could understand anyone ranking him as high as third. Seems ahead of Strider, ahead of Garrett Cole. Yeah, that that's a bridge too far. But it's understandable to me if you wanted to take Yamamoto third among starting pitchers. I'm going to play it more cautiously than that. I think there's a clear top seven, uh, including Cole and Strider, uh, Kevin Gosman, who you know was one of those pitchers. You know, Sarah's comped compared to. Um, uh, Yoshinobu Yamamoto, he's my number three pitcher. And, you know, there's Corbin Burns, Zach Gallen, Luis Castillo, Zach Wheeler. Like all of those guys, they're just so bankable at that highly volatile position that um, I'd rather safeguard against the unknowns of Yamamoto, uh, Yoshinobu, Yoshinobu Yamamoto in his first year in the majors. I'd rather safeguard against that by taking one of those guys over him. And you know, I love Tarek Skubal, so that's going to be hard for me to justify as well. But my point is Yamamoto is right in that group. I, he, you, if you plan on drafting him in 2024, you have to draft him as if he already is a true ace. And it would hardly be a shock if he lived up to it. Yeah, look, <laughs> massive contract here for Yamamoto. 12 years, I think in part, because he's 25 years old. We just don't see 25-year-old pitchers make it to the market here, basically ever. So obviously that's part of the reason. I think the Dodgers also wanted to bring down that AAV, obviously over 12 years. I think it comes out to like 27 million per year, uh, which again is not as high as like a uh, Garrett Cole has gotten in the past, but it's still a massive contract for Yamamoto. Did want to put some numbers to uh, that article that you mentioned from Eno Saris of The Athletic. The, some of those comps that he made, just putting numbers to it. The fastball sits 95 miles per hour, topping out at 99. That was data from the WBC. And the physical characteristics of the pitch would make it a 92nd percentile fastball. The splitter earned a stuff plus rating of 155 in the WBC. Last year in Major League Baseball, there was no splitter that had a stuff plus rating of even 140. So just to put that pers in perspective again, 155. For Yamamoto splitter, no pitcher in baseball with a 140 among starting pitchers. And then now, the curveball, as you mentioned, elite spin rate and stuff plus rating that's similar to like Merrill Kelly and Seth Lugo. Yeah, too. It, it is worth con putting that into con the context of there. The balls feel different between the two leagues. I believe the 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 ball in Japan that they use is tackier, uh, so that would allow for more spin. So that is something to keep in mind just because it was far, it, it would have been far away the highest spinning uh, splitter, right? That, that's the number you cited. It, well, it was stuff plus, and it was from the stuff WBC. Plus. Okay, I don't right. know that they were, were they using pre tag baseballs in the Oh, WBC? that's a good point. Yeah. yeah, I don't even know the, that's true. Okay, forget what I just said. But <laughs> no, that, no, it's still a worthy point from like, that is part of what he's adjusting to. Yeah, I'm not even sure more spin would be a good thing for a splitter. So just forget all that. But it it is a diff like the the way the ball actually feels in the hand is is going to be different coming from one league to another, which is part of part of the unpredictability of making that shift. How well will he adjust to it? Will his stuff play exactly the same? Those are things we can't really know until we see it in action. But that data from the World Baseball Classic um, makes it feel safer than it otherwise would. Let's take a quick break. When we return, we told you all the amazing things about Yamamoto. Let's maybe talk a little bit about the downside, what the ADP looks like, because that has been on the rise. We'll talk about all that right after this. On the next NFL Monday QB, you know Prescott and Purdy and Mahomes and Hurts. But who will we call? The greatest QB of them all. 
Recap the Christmas weekend action on CBS Sports Network. Welcome back in again. Yoshinobu Yamamoto signing with the Dodgers. 12 years, $325 million. We talked about all the amazing stats and the pitches and the characteristics of those pitches. I think one of the clear negatives, Scott, is the size. Maybe not, but I guess that's something that people could point to. Yamamoto is listed at five foot ten, and again, there have been pitchers that have succeeded at that height or even less than that in the past. But it is something that you know someone might point to and say, "Okay, that could be a potential downside." You pointed out his workloads; he's thrown 170 plus innings three years in a row. He's thrown 190 plus in two of the past three years, so maybe that isn't an issue. And you know, the K per nine, right over a strikeout per inning, is that necessarily going to translate right away? I have some questions about that. Maybe I shouldn't, given like everything we just talked about. But I, I think, and I, I, I think I'm right in saying this. I think the strikeout rates tend to be higher in the majors. Oh, they are. Japan. They are. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's. Do you worry it, at all? It about- could get even better. Is the point? Like the the one the one part of Yamamoto's stat line that you may kind of be like, eh, is that 9.5 K per nine over the last three seasons? But it's likely to go up rather than down in the majors. I did quickly look at Kodai Senga too because his last three years in Japan, it was 10.9 K per nine, 9.4, 9.7. And then his first year in the majors here, 10.9. So it actually went up from where it was the past two years in Japan before Kodai Senga get here. Any worries about the size, Scott? Five foot 10 for Yamamoto. Long term, I could see it being an issue, but. Like I said, he he had back-to-back years with 193 innings, uh, 2021, 2022, and and then in 2023 he threw 171 innings, which is still an awfully big workload for today's game. And I take that as a good sign. Uh, I, I mean, it may catch up, catch up to him eventually, but I I feel like that I I feel like we should take given given the way pitchers are handled these days, where you get all of these hybrid roles guys following openers guys working four innings at a time max effort and maybe never breaking through to true starting pitcher status for all they may have all the talent in the world but they don't get that chance really to to break through and become the kind of starting pitcher we need them to be in fantasy if a guy's proven he can do that i take that as a good sign more than in the past we might have looked at that workload as a sign of of trouble injuries could always happen it, the the changes in the feel of the baseball could lead to an injury for uh for Yoshinobu Yamamoto but he's proven to be durable so far and certainly from a redraft context you're you're drafting your team for 2024 and then drafting a new team and completely new team in 2025 i don't think i don't think the injury risk is worth worrying about Let's talk about this price tag, Scott. The ADP on Yoshinobu Yamamoto, it's on the rise. And I thought it was just like a December thing. Okay, people are learning more about Yamamoto. It really just coincides with that article that was released by Eno Saris, which we talked a lot about, just breaking down the characteristics of each of his pitches. And it's so crazy. If you look at before that article uh, came out, the ADP for Yamamoto was 74.5 as the 22nd starting pitcher off the board. Since it was released on December 12th, 60.1 as the 14th starting pitcher off the board. So moving up 14 spots and eight pitcher spots for Yamamoto up to SP 14. What do you think about the price tag? I mean, I did the same thing in my own rankings for the same reason. It was basically those exact that exact same start point and end point Yamamoto in my rankings. And frankly, now that he's with the Dodgers of all teams and we know he's going to get all the win potential that comes with that. I'm, I'm tempted to move him up even more as I was laying out earlier in this podcast where I don't know. Um, there's the seven, there's Tyler glass. Now who's also joining the Dodgers. There's Tarek Skubal who I like. I, I might move Yamamoto up to 10th now. Based who, who on do you have things. just ahead of Yamamoto? It would be Skubal. No, you already oh, have him at 10th. Currently. Yeah, currently. currently. Yeah. Uh, okay. So currently, I believe I have Yamamoto 16th prior to making this change. Give me just a second to pull up the spreadsheet here. Logan Webb is currently who I have directly ahead of Yamamoto. And then ahead of him is Freddie Peralta. I feel like I got to take Yamamoto over him. 
And then ahead of that is Kodai Senga, who, you know, I was just saying is flawed compared to Yamamoto. So I feel like I got to take Yamamoto ahead of him too. Uh, and there's Pablo Lopez, Cole Reagans, who I'm higher on than the consensus. Blake Snell is 10th. So Blake Snell or, or Yoshinobu Yamamoto, Frank, who you think in there? I, th I think I'll take Yamamoto, but I also think I'm just going to have Blake Snell a little bit lower than you. Um, I don't think I would take Yamamoto. Oh, have, I know you'll have Cole Reagans lower. So who, yes. who do you think you won't take him ahead of? I was going to say, I don't think I would take him ahead of Pablo Lopez. I think yeah. that's kind of, but being around Tarek Skubu and Glass now, I, I feel like that kind of makes sense, right? Because there is some risk with those guys. You know, we haven't seen them do it over, you know, 150 plus innings in the past. We haven't seen Yamamoto in the majors yet. So it kind of feels like that's the right range for him to fall into. So somewhere in that like Glass now, Skubu, Pablo Lopez, Yamamoto. Yeah, I think probably like 10 to 12. I think that makes sense as, as a ranking for him. Um, in case you're wondering, what does the Dodgers rotation look like at the moment? So we know they traded for Tyler Glass now. Now they signed Yamamoto. Walker Bueller is coming back from his second Tommy John surgery. Bobby Miller is their SP4. Think about that. Like just a few weeks ago, Bobby Miller was their SP2. Now he's their SP4. And Emmett Sheehan penciled in as their SP5. And, you know, they still have some depth pieces. They can, you know, they could kind of go with Sheehan and, and Ryan Yarbrough if they want to. Whatever. Either way, no matter how you look at it. This rotation is amazing. And guess what? It's going to be even better in the future when they get Shohei Otani back next year as a pitcher. So, oh my goodness. Just oh, yeah. I mean, the Dodgers' biggest flaw last year was their starting rotation, and they won 100 games. <laughs> and now they've turned that flaw into a strength. I think that if, if there is a downside to this signing, this Yamamoto signing for fantasy purposes, it's that the Dodgers have a lot of interesting young arms that they introduced over the course of last season as they were struggling to fill out those, their rotation. And now they're now they're blocked from me. I, I imagine Emmett Sheehan has more or less locked up that fifth starter job because he was the most impressive of those who still remain. Ryan Pepio, of course, was moved in the Tyler Glass now deal. Um, but, you know, now there's no opportunity for Gavin Stone to break in. On opening day, or Kyle Hurt, who I liked a lot and talked about in our uh, last podcast, looking at, uh, at, at, uh, at looking at pitcher prospects. Nick Frasso is another one. Yeah, uh, they got they, some names. They, they got some names. Yeah, and their draft value will go down in response to this, since there's not the opening. But I will point out Walker Bueller's coming back from two Tommy John, his second Tommy John surgery. Uh, Tyler Glass now is not exactly a model of durability himself. Career high 120 innings this past year. So there will be opportunities for those younger pitchers still. At some point, Clayton Kershaw is going to come back. We can't forget that. He's he's a free agent, actually, Scott. Well, I think the expectation is he'll... he'll he probably will sign with that. the Dodgers, but it's, yeah, it's not a guarantee, I guess. Uh, yeah. Um, but that would make sense, right? Like they could have Emmett Sheehan just kind of empty the clip and be their fifth starter for the first half of the season. And then they bring in Kershaw and he's just their SP five for the second half. It's crazy. And it could work yeah. out that way. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I was just thinking as you were saying that, like, okay, so Yamamoto, Glasnow, Bueller, Bobby Miller, and next year, they're going to have Shohei Otani to add to the rotation. Oh, disgusting. Mm. Oof, man. Yeah. Look, it's a good time to be a Dodgers fan. I know a lot of fans of the game are going to complain. Super team this, that. Look, in baseball, there's still a lot of variance. The best team does not always win, so I don't want to hear any of that. I'm a Yankees fan, and yes, I'm upset that they didn't get Yamamoto, but it's not just the best team always wins in baseball. In fact, it rarely ever happens that way. On paper, they should win. They are the betting favorites to win the World Series. But it doesn't always work out that way, Scott. So let's see how the games play out and, and see how every team looks by the time we get to the playoffs. Who's left on the market, in case you're wondering, and in case you are a fan of the Yankees, the Mets, the Phillies, the Red Sox, all these teams that missed out? Blake Snell, Jordan Montgomery, Shota Imanaga, who is also coming over from Japan, a little bit older, 30 years old, left-handed pitcher, doesn't throw as hard. But by everything I've read and you know, watched some scouting videos on him, 
seems like he's a pretty accomplished pitcher as well. Marcus Stroman is out there, Lucas Gilito, and then we have the trade market, which features Dylan Cease, Shane Bieber, and maybe Corbin Burns. I've read some stuff. It sounds like maybe the Brewers are might be pulling back a little bit on shopping Corbin Burns, but my expectation is that Dylan Cease will be traded this offseason and probably Shane Bieber. So there still are some pitchers out there, Scott, and and lots lots to happen still. I mean, so hopefully this will kind of set things off and, and we can get the rest of the free agent market moving. Yeah, I think this was holding it up. Uh, the fact that Blake Snell is a Scott, like Blake Snell's the, the biggest name left, right? The fact he's a Scott Boris client, it wouldn't surprise me if if that goes on a couple more months. Uh, so it, it may still be slow moving, but this is a big, uh, a big uh, roadblock, I guess, that has now been cleared for more for more uh, off-season activity to happen. All right. Well, again, the big news, Yoshinobu Yamamoto signing with the Dodgers, 12 years, $325 million. We're going to wrap there for Scott. I am Frank. Thanks, as always, for watching and listening to Fantasy Baseball today. And we'll be back again next week. Bye-bye.